to Volume 1, Issue 85 of the all-new, all-different, number one comics podcast. You know, Bob, I said it, I'm sure I said it with Issue 50, with Issue 75. 85's a milestone, too, even though, you know, it's it's 10 after 75. Whatever. Uh, I was going to say, <laughs> I mean, 15 more episodes. Right? 15 more to go. And I think it's pretty topical, too, because this week... Marvel put out that 85th anniversary special. Look, and this is dropping on the 85th anniversary special of Marvel Comics. So We did not do that on purpose. I, I, I kid you not, we did not do that on purpose. Are you sure? Because I feel like some kind of planning went I mean, into this. Subconsciously, <laughs> maybe, but that's, that's just too perfect to plan out. It's true, it's true. Uh, the gods are on your side, I guess, Bob, so that's all I can say. Bob, who are we? What are we here for? Where am I? <laughs> I don't know who you are, <laughs> but as always, I am your co-host, Bob, and with me is, I think, my co-host with the most. What's your name again? Uh, I think it's Dan, but you know, just before we hit record, I, we were talking about if it's possible for a dog to be demented, <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, so I don't know. I think I'm Dan, but... Uh, that's up for debate. I mean, de- depending on who you ask <laughs> in this specific day, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm called everything. So, I mean, it could be Bob today. <laughs> I could be something tomorrow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, somebody else could come up to me, you know, call me something different. <laughs> you know, it is funny for the name Robert or, or whatever. There's so many different variations of that. There's so many different things you can say. And, yeah, I, I think at this point you've probably heard them all, Bob. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, just... <laughs> Just look how long the name Robert has been around Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. how popular it is. Sure, sure. I mean, just at my previous employment alone, at one time there were four Roberts working in the store. (laughs) Ah, well, either way. But like this and each other week, you know, we cover a brand new number one issue that is hopefully coming out Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. week. We give it a deep dive review story beats the narrative the art whatever else you feel like so what are we covering today bob i'm very very excited to announce that from image comics in association with skybound entertainment we have the next chapter in the universal monsters line of comics universal monsters frankenstein i have been so excited about this one i loved frankenstein as a kid i think Three or four times I dressed up as Frankenstein for Halloween and had the, <laughs> you know, the green face paint and my mom would go find me a torn up suit from Goodwill or something. And Did you have the bolts? Oh Did yeah, I had the bolts. You know I had the nice. bolts, Bob. Uh, it nice. was all handmade and it was super fun and super cool. I'm very excited to cover this Frankenstein book. Bob, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's better than Dracula. Dracula was fun. Anyways, we'll get into it. We'll, 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 we'll touch base. <laughs> but we also cover comic book related news, whether it be movie, whether it be creator related, where there is, or if there is any news that week, which of course some weeks are going to be lighter than other weeks. That's right, Bob. Our fingers are on the pulse of the comic book world. <laughs> and I don't know, it's alive. Ooh, is that topical? <laughs> it's hey. alive! Hey. <laughs> but with all that being said, we'll see you in a minute. And we are back with the... I, I don't know what noise I just made, but it sounded like I stepped on a cat's tail. Uh, <laughs> what you said about dementia earlier? <laughs> yeah, right. Who are you? Uh, wait a second. Is Where, your name Frank? Where am I? <laughs> Frank and Castle? Yes, it is. We are back with episode issue number 85 of the All New All Different Number One Comics Podcast. Here to talk to you all about comic book news. Bob, it's a light week. I'm gonna I'm gonna just start with saying, you know, the most important news of the week. Jeff the Land Shark is getting a one shot in the Venom War storyline. And I saw that. Jeff the Land Shark is getting its own symbiote. So wow. That's exciting. I can't wait. I'm almost, I, I'm hoping that this like really takes hold, you know, like a secondary character, like, uh, I, I don't know, like a, like a spider Gwen or a, uh, something of that nature, a, a Laura Kenny, you know, get 
venomized Jeff the Land Shark into comics. Like, get him out there. Like, let's do it. Make it a regular part. Like, I want to see an updated Marvel poster with a venomized Jeff the Land Shark on it. So, can we please work on that, Marvel? Thank you. Speaking of Marvel, Bob, Ultron is returning. Yeah, I heard. Oh, my God. To, it's about time. <laughs> right? So, in this Vision Disney Plus series, that is still happening. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty surprising, to tell you the truth, with all the stuff that was up on their slate that's been taken off and, and all of that. We're still getting a Vision Disney Plus series. James Spader's going to return and return as Ultron. So, pretty crazy, yeah, pretty I, exciting I'm, news. I'm excited to hear. I thought James Spader did a great job. Voice in Ultron. Yeah, he was he was perfect. I can't think of it. I mean, I'm sure somebody else could have done it, but he was he he did it perfect. I really well, yeah, liked but his I mean, there there are those actors out there who just have specific voices. Mm -hmm, no, mm -hmm. I mean you have uh, Tony Todd. Oh yeah, Tony Todd is definitely wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah Tony Tony Todd might have the most recognizable <laughs> voice of all time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Man, uh, you know, it's it's impossible for me not to jump on a soapbox and start talking. When somebody mentions Tony Todd, uh, you know, and this isn't news related or comic book related, although there are, there are two comic books. But uh, Final Destination, man, just my guiltiest pleasure movie franchise of all time. I he love it so was much. creepy. He honestly made it for me because while I love Final Destination and I love all the crazy deaths and, and deaths design and all of that weird stuff that's going on in final destination like he's just like the only thing that ties it all in and they did that one movie and i can't think of which one it was but they did one without him and it was just it was like missing so much it was like oh I bet. yeah what, what are you doing i had proposed this to um, a co-worker just a little while ago who really enjoys horror movies and we were talking about horror and i was like you know what what I would love to see in my lifetime, in all honesty, is like a Final Destination anthology series. You know, give me like one hour long episodes or whatever and have Tony Todd as the Crypt Keeper because holy shit, man, uh, that needs to happen. I, I mean, don't... He, he was basically the Crypt Keeper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it just, it writes itself. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I really need to put uh, pen to paper and make this happen, you know. I don't have any cool Hollywood connections, but anyways, somebody out there listening does. <laughs> Bob, we also have, now, bear with me on the name here. Um, I've never heard of this series. I am thinking you probably have not either, but Devilina? Uh, Devilina. Okay, Devilina, who is the sister of Satan, um, and also a 1975 Atlas comic, is getting a live action adaptation. Where did this come from? <laughs> I don't know, and I can't really, um, you know, talk or speculate about anything because, mm -hmm. yeah, like you said, I do not know. I've never heard of Devilina. Yeah, likewise. It seems to be like a Vampirella type of, you know, thing or something. But, I mean, you know, the mid-70s, that was like all the rage, like that kind of that kind of thing. Um, so... I don't know. That's happening. I don't really have much to say about it. I, I hope it's cool. Uh, definitely looks like the source material could be kind of cool. You know, some really, at least that cover art on that. Very nice cover art. Very good. Well done. Sonic 3 trailer dropped. Mm -hmm. I haven't watched it. <laughs> have you? You know, honestly, I haven't even seen the first two films. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I haven't seen Sonic. I'm not no. that invested for, for whatever reason. It's not... I have no problems with it, but it's just not like a big thing for me. You know, even something like the Mario movie, I went and, and I sat down and tried to watch it. And I was just like, I don't dislike it. It's just, it's not my thing. You know, it's, it's, if I'm going to see a video game adaptation, it's more something like Silent Hill or Resident Evil. Those are really the only games that I really played. You know, I played some Mario when I was a kid, but it was just there. Like I didn't You'd rather watch the Bob Hoskins channel because I'm a Mario <laughs> Brothers. Game. You know, that one is fun, Bob. I, I have to say. <laughs> it's interesting to say the least. <laughs> Bob, uh, speaking of interesting, maybe, maybe not. Um, the Crow 2024, you know, dropped a, a week or two ago. It's not doing so great, Bob. The, the reviews are bad. The, uh, the director of the original movie has come out and said that he thought the remake was a cynical cra cash grab and with 
he also said with not much cash to grab. So he kind of hit hard. I don't know. It's it's super interesting because I'm going to say what I think a lot of people have already said. The only thing interesting about the original Crow movie is the Brandon Lee aspect of it. It wasn't like the greatest script. It's pretty generic, you know, archetypal superhero stuff, hero stuff, whatever. And it wasn't done especially good. It is campy in a fun way for sure, but totally dated. Yeah, very, very dated. Very 90s, you know, fit into the whole, like, grunge aesthetic and grunge grunge scene and all of that, which was cool for its time. Mm-hmm. But it's a product of its time. Yeah. I don't think that anyone's ever, you know, looking at it as, this is one of the greatest films ever made. This is no. the greatest screenplay. No. This is acted wonderfully. Any of that. Uh, but it's got, you know, it's, it's cult status because of what it is and then because of Brandon Lee and everything. Um... Now, I haven't heard James O'Barr come out and say anything. Uh, Bob, James O'Barr is still alive, right? I I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, James O'Barr, of course, the creator of The Crow. uh, And, uh, you know, when I heard some backstory of of why James O'Barr came out with The Crow and all of that, it's it's, it's pretty sad. He um, lost his wife or fiancé to, like, a drunk driver and... Um, just really couldn't cope with the grief and ended up writing The Crow for, for that reason and everything. And uh, yeah, just a, a really sad story behind it. And then, of course, you know, I guess uh, the guy thinks, all right, great. You know, I wrote this story in tribute to my wife. And now, you know, I'm cashing a check for, you know, from the studio. They're, they're going to make a big budget movie out of it and put Bruce Lee's son in it and everything. And then, of course, he dies on set, you know, so just not great luck, you know, surrounding this thing and then <clears throat> and then this movie not doing so well so i i don't know it, when the first uh images and, and trailers and everything came out yeah i mean i'm not gonna lie i didn't have high hope for it at all it looked a little cringy a little jared leto jokery and i mean i guess that's what people are seeing so so speak uh, before you go any further mm-hmm. um speak <laughs> speaking of movies based off adaptation have you heard about the borderlands movie yes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the next couple of days it'll already be on video on demand yeah after not even a month of release yeah this is getting horrible reviews horrible reviews so I don't have any connection to Borderlands I've never played a game or anything like that so I'm not sure I don't either but I mean if after a month it's already starting to go on video on demand not a great look (laughs) <laughs> no, and I mean the film. The film was, you know, marketed pretty well. You know, I can't say it was all over the place, but yeah. I mean, I, and I'm pretty sure it was a big budget movie. I don't, I don't know the, you know, exactly how how much they spent on it, but well, know. I mean they they spent a good amount of money just for the cast alone. Mm-hmm, I mean, mm-hmm. Jack Black did a voice. Uh, you know, um, Kate oh, Blanchett was in there. Yeah, Kate Blanchett, Kevin Hart, yep. directed by Eli Roth. So, yep. yeah, I mean, I yeah, I would I would love to see the budget on this thing. Um, very very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just trying to browse through here to see if I could if I could grab a budget for it, mm-hmm. but it's not, it's not something that is like super readily available without you know doing a deeper dive. So I'm not gonna waste anybody's time, but um. Yeah, it looks like it had grossed a total of twenty five point one million. Um, that's that's not good. <laughs> no, <laughs> and one of the biggest things I'm good. hearing is it tried to follow, you know, that whole Guardians of the Galaxy mm-hmm, James mm-hmm. Gunn kind of thing. Oh yeah, and either you know which. I mean, that whole thing is kind of played out, because, I mean, when Guardians came out, you know, it seemed like everybody was trying to copy it. Yes, uh-huh. But, I mean, it, it just it just sounds like it fell flat. I mean, will I give it a shot eventually? Yes. I mean, because, you know, I do believe you shouldn't really listen to critics and reviews, you know. Sure. You should watch something yeah. and make up your own mind, Absolutely. you know. Of course, that's why we always poo-poo on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, I mean, this movie, I'm just hearing universal hate. Yeah, and I, I did circle back around and do my little bit of research there. Uh, it's estimated 
a hundred and fifteen million dollar budget Ooh, with twenty five point one is the uh, the the takeaway. So that's that's bad. That's so yeah. probably probably when it's all said and done, it'll probably be at least a hundred million dollar loss. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, sad, sad, uh, sad series of events there. Um, Bob, in other news, and, and most of these are just series announcements, so you know I'll I'll just rattle these off really quick, and then if you have anything, um, mm-hmm. uh, Psylocke is getting her own series by Alyssa Wong. I think some of uh, a lot of this is probably already known, but you know it's it's like public now and previews and everything. So I just wanted to showcase these uh, West Coast Avengers. Uh, with Ultron as the big bad uh, by Jerry Duggan is, is going to be dropping. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's one that I'm really excited about. Bob, were you a fan? Did you watch um, season two of What If, the Disney Plus animated series? I did. Okay, so you're familiar with the uh, Kahori, Kahori episode? Mm-hmm. Is that how you pronounce that character's name? Kahori. Kahori. Okay. Man, that was that was the standout for me. In all honesty, that was like really the only episode where I, I was glued to my Yeah, I mean, uh, she, was probably, she was probably the best part. Yeah, or at least the best character in uh, season two. Yeah, that was good. That was really good. The episode was really well well done. Um, so she is getting a one shot, and you know, again, like like I was joking around about the sim- symbiote uh, Jeff the Land Shark. I really hope that this sticks. I hope that the character is introduced in the six one six proper and gets some, uh, you know, more attention and everything because that episode was so good. Such a great character with cool backstory and everything so Mm -hmm. i'm really excited for that bob what if Minnie mouse became captain marvel what would you do because marvel's gonna answer that question (laughs) uh yeah that's happening you said Minnie mouse Minnie. yeah oh Minnie mouse i'm sorry Minnie mouse yeah okay And, and we're talking like the 70s captain marvel too not uh not the current uh, Negasonic Teenage Warhead also getting a one shot. So this is this is a first because this character has never been uh, had had their own series. I don't believe. No, nothing no. that I can think of. Um, again, just a one shot. But you know, a one shot is a good thing. It's like kind of testing the waters a, a little bit. You know, maybe if it does well, we'll get like a mini or something after that. So. Yeah, which I mean, it, it is kind of weird considering that's already an existing character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very. Yeah, agreed. Uh, and and last up on my list here. Of course, from Boom Studios, Power Rangers Prime, beginning November 13th, is going to drop. And, Bob, that's pretty much all I've got for news and announcements, uh, unless you have anything you want to hop on. I, I didn't see a lot of Star Wars news out there this week, so... No. Yeah, your your sandbox is kind of empty. Well, but... I mean, it, except from, uh, from what I saw, there is a petition mm-hmm. going around online to save the acolyte. Nice. And Bob, I will sign that petition. Oh, okay. I think if I'm not mistaken, it might be over 50,000 names. Wow. And I've also heard that somebody started a petition to keep it dead. Oh, God. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, you got to have the opposition, right? <laughs> but that one is not doing too well. <sighs> well, here. good. I hope not. Um, those, those people are a lot louder than they are active, so that's mm-hmm. for sure. Well, that about wraps up news and announcements. We will take a quick break and return in just a moment. Hello and welcome back to the all new, all different number one comics podcast issue number 85 milestone issue. Bob, you are old. I can't believe it. Let's talk about some new comics that dropped in comic book shops this very week. Bob, from Detective Comics Comics, we got Absolute Power Origins number two, the origin of Task Force X, and a tie-in to the Absolute Power event. Bob, Absolute Power Task Force 7 number five, a tie-in to the Absolute Power event that's so exciting that puts Amanda Waller... I have no idea what it does. It's about Amanda Waller. That's all I know. That's the only thing I know. It's so exciting, we haven't read anything about it. Yep, very. Bob... Over to Marvel Comics. That's right. The House of Ideas. That's right. Aliens versus Avengers. A four-issue limited series. Bob, this one's uh, very, very interesting. You know, we're, we're getting the uh, Xenomorphs there and the regular 616 with the Avengers. Um, it's written by Jonathan Hickman, so you know it's going to be crazy. Art by Asad uh, Ribic, um, I think is how I'm supposed to pronounce yeah. their last name. Yeah, this looks cool. 
I am not gonna lie, you know, I've got my little baby stack here. I didn't pick this up because I'm limited right now, but I'll pick it up later on if it does really well. But I, th I think it's got a very high cover price, to tell you the truth. I think, uh, yeah, it's a 799 er so you gotta really be into this to to pick that up. That's that's a that's a bit of money. That'll be a, that'll be a trade paperback for me. Yeah, likewise. Uh, <laughs> We got Chasm, Curse of Cain, issue number one, a four-issue limited series featuring Ben Riley as Chasm. Bob, we also have Deadpool, Team Up, issue number one. This is a five-issue limited series with art and story by Rob Liefeld featuring Deadpool teaming up with Major X, Crystar, Ghost Spider, Wolverine, and Hulk. That's right, Crystar, Crystar's epic return. Christ. <laughs> and That's so out of left field. Very is. Wait, very is? I don't know what I just said, but it very much is. Uh, Bob, um, I know, you know, a while ago, Rob Liefeld announced that he would not be doing any more Deadpool, like he was retiring from the character. And now Rob Liefeld has announced that he is not going to be working with Marvel anymore. So this is his last Marvel project altogether. I'm not sure where he's going to go or what he's going to do. Maybe he's going to start writing. Uh, maybe maybe he'll take over uh, for Superman. How do you feel about that, Bob? <laughs> wow. I, 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 I really want to see how Superman is drawn. Uh, Superman doesn't have feet, so it's fine. <laughs> Back over to Detective Comics Comics. Green Arrow 15, an absolute power event tie-in. That's right. Amanda Waller playing with arrows over there. Uh, back over to Marvel, Incredible Hulk, Annual 1, The Infinity Watch Part 6. We've got Hulk versus Thanos just fighting. Hulk's got an eight-pack on his stomach. It's, it's crazy. The aforementioned Marvel 85th Anniversary Special, an anthology of stories told in the far future of the 85th century about Marvel heroes from the past. The first appearance of somebody whose name I'm not going to <laughs> attempt to announce. Um, yep, we'll just leave that one on the table there. Uh, Bob, we got NYX number two. Lara Kenny, the first appearance of Local, a mutant with city manipulation abilities. So City Boy came over to Marvel? Yep, I guess so. Wow. <laughs> right? Bob, the new uh, Moon Knight series, Phases of the Moon Knight, issue number one. The first appearance of Moon Knight and the... Uh, sorry, Moon Knight of the Old Crusades, as well as the origin of the Shroud as Moon Knight. One of the be one of the best titles of all time. Oh yeah, Phases of the Moon Knight. Such a cool, cool title. Bob, I'm not gonna lie, I did pick up my copy of Sesame Street number one from Ani Press. Uh, it's right here, you know, Sesame Street number one. Grover lends a hand. Don't ask oh. me why. It's by Joey Esposito. Um, I read through it. I didn't quite get to the end yet because it's awfully wordy for a Sesame Street book. <laughs> But it's kind of fun. It shows each one of the characters, you know, like uh, whatever this dude's name is. What's, what's the guy? Is it Grover? Um, he's he's going through town. He's running into everybody. The the counts counting leaves on a tree. Big Bird's trying to put together a, a drawer or something. And it's 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 very interesting. Um, very, I don't know. It was kind of cool. I actually kind of thought it was cool. Like I said, I haven't finished it yet, so I don't know what happens in the end. So nobody spoil it for me. But um, yeah, that exists. <laughs> Somebody lends Grover a hand. <laughs> they do. How about uh, Peach Momoko is back? Ultimate X Men Six, the first cameo appearance of a potential member of the Ultimate X Men. Bob, I just want to again. This is going to be off air. You guys are going to be able to see this. Look at this variant cover. Like that is Very a nice. nice cover. Very nice. I don't know who this is by, but I love it. It's a really good variant cover. Very yeah, nice. I had to pick that one up, it, which is crazy because. Peach Momoko's art on the series is so good, and her covers are really good. And whoever did that cover, I just I, I had to pick it up because it was it was really, really cool. Um, I you know I'm gonna stall for like one second here because yeah, it looks like it's Stephanie Hans, so that tracks. Yeah, uh, really really cool. Uh, Bob, we got Venom War, Zombiotes issue number one, a three issue event tie-in with just a a crazy crazy cover on that. Venom Verse Reborn, issue number three, the first appearance of Cindy Moon, aka Silk, as Venom from an alternate reality. Terrifying. Bob, a book that I know you're excited about, Void Rivals, issue number 12. I, I love when Void Rivals <laughs> comes out. I mean, the whole Energon universe mm -hmm. so far. Now, you guys can't see, but Bob, of course, is supporting his Energon t-shirt today. 
It's a, a very clever take on a Gatorade logo. Again, I did not plan this out. <laughs> sure, sure. Nobody believes you. Uh, but yeah, a uh, really cool shirt. Um, yeah, Void Rivals, issue number 12. The first appearance of, uh, I don't know, Gallant? Or what is that? <laughs> Goofus and Gallant? I don't, I don't know. What Goofus the characters. and Gallant. Uh, I don't know, Bob. I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly. But uh, feel free to chime in and pronounce it. Goliant. Goliant. That's, that's what I said, right? Uh, <laughs> a major threat, Bob. So, I don't know. Could be a, a huge key player. Hopefully you got your copy. I'm guessing that's a bad guy. I guess so. Uh, a, a major threat, yeah, probably. Uh, X Men number three dropped this week with the first appearance of Agent something, uh, Agent of One. So, Agent uh, of One. Uh, o N E, you know, an acronym or whatever. So, not too. I'm sure. trying to, yeah, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to think of what that could be because I mean, it, I, be, I believe, I, I mean, I believe there's an organization in Marvel Comics. Mm-hmm. It's O N E. Mm-hmm. I just, I just can't place what it, what or who they are. Yeah, likewise. Uh, last up from Detective Comics Comics Zero, our thirtieth anniversary special, a one shot revisiting the story of Green Lantern's Hal Jordan's time as the villain Parallax. Wow, I know you guys want to revisit that, so make sure you do. <laughs> That's about it for new books out this week. Unless you had anything that you wanted to jump on, Bob. Great. With that being said, we are going to take a, uh, you know, I'm going to say eight seconds. I want you guys to count. Hold your breath for eight seconds and we'll be right back. Bob, welcome back to the all new, all different number one comics podcast. How are you? I'm out of breath. Uh, Yeah, that was a long breath hold. I agree. Uh, Bob, it is time for the, of course, portion of the show where we talk about the book that we talk about. The Potatoes and Potatoes? The Potatoes and Potatoes. That's right. No meat here. No meat. Oh, no meat. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have uh, my co-host with the most is vegan. You know, Bob, it's very interesting. You know, my wife does eat meat. Um, I don't. But there's no meat in this house. None whatsoever. Uh, if you, you know, came over starving, Bob, I, you know, you'd be shit out of luck, I guess. You'd have to eat some noodles or something. Let's see. In my refrigerator right now, I have pulled pork, <laughs> I have hot dogs, I have hamburger patties, I have sandwich meats. So you're compensating for the both of us, is what you're telling me. Pretty much. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm saying I will never be vegan, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I don't know how I would live without red meat. <laughs> well... Uh, hot there's dogs, a, eh, I, we still don't know 100% what's in hot dogs. But yeah, it could be anything. Um, yeah. I do hear, though, you know, I've, I've really only had the uh, vegetarian hot dogs, of course, but uh, with, with the exception of, you know, I stopped eating meat when I, a long time ago, but uh, I've had a regular hot dog before, but it's been, you know, over 20 years at this point. But mm. I will say a lot of people who do eat meat tell me you can't tell any difference in the hot dogs whatsoever. Uh, now you know that's some of the other they, stuff. That's sure, what they say about those hamburger patties. I, I mean, I think the Beyond or the Impossible, yes, but you know some of the other ones like with chunks of vegetables in it or something. Yeah, sure. I mean, you're going to tell the difference, but no, I, I seriously do hear that about the hot dogs from a lot of people. You just can't tell any difference whatsoever. Either way, welcome to the all new, all different vegetarian podcast. I'm your host Broccoli, and that's asparagus. See. See, when you tune into a comic book podcast, <laughs> you didn't think you'd get vegan food information, did you? Um, Bob, I'd like to share a wholesome uh, lentil shepherd's pie recipe with you today. I'd like to talk about a haiku. <laughs> uh, uh, roses, no, I, I don't know haiku. I can't do that. It's been too long since I've been out of school. Anyways, let's get back to the book, Bob. Universal Monsters Frankenstein. It's alive, book one. Bob, from Image Comics and Skybound. Man, let's talk about this thing. Um... I don't know. It may be a surprise. It may not be. I'm, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Let's break it down a little bit. Of course, we're going to go through our, our normal things where we uh, talk about the book, talk about the beats, all those things that you said at the top. Um, I'm going to do what I do, you know. Talk about the creators. I'm going to talk about the creators. I'm going to talk about the, uh, what's it called? Um, the synopsis from Image and Skybound. We're going to talk about that first. Uh, then we're going to listen to your synopsis. 
We're going to listen to my synopsis. Um, now, pulling this up from Image is something that, you know, a a better podcast host would already have <laughs> Dear job. Up, and, up and running. Um, me, on the other hand, you know. Um, see, uh, see, if you different. ate red meat, you'd be prepared. I'd be prepared already. You're correct. Uh, Bob, modern day horror visionary resurrects one of the most iconic monsters, award winning creator Michael Walsh, Walsh presents an electrifying new version of the horror classic. Each issue of the limited series tells the shocking story behind one of the body parts used to create the unforgettable monster in the original film. In this first issue, Dr. Henry Frankenstein begins his unholy quest to create life by robbing the grave of a decorated police officer. But little does he know that the corpse has a son who is mourning a father, and that young boy will forever change Frankenstein's life. Holy shit. Sorry about the puns there. Yeah, there's there's definitely puns. Um, I'm going to go into my synopsis, then we're going to talk about Michael Walsh, okay? I might be breaking format. I feel like I do that differently, but either way, bear with me here for a second. Universal Monsters Frankenstein opens with a young boy in a graveyard at his recently de deceased father's grave. He mourns and talks to his father until a pair of grave robbers show up. The grave robbers are looking for a useful skull, but the father's skull is damaged. They settle for the hands. The pair, of course, turn out to be Dr. Frankenstein and Fritz. They take the body and bring it to their dissection room, and the boy secretly follows. The boy stays with his father's corpse while the doctor and Fritz leave the room. The doctor brings the body to life. The boy returns to search for his father and finds the monster. He holds the hand which belonged to his father and then he runs away to find the doctor and stop him. Just as he holds a knife above the doctor, Fritz shows up behind him and the book fades to black. Uh, of course, you might notice that you know there's no mention of not constructing what's the word uh putting the body together or whatever there it's not really you know it's just kind of implied in the book it's not really shown mm -hmm. or talked about uh but we all know that that happens so uh, forgive me if that was left out let's talk about michael walsh michael walsh is a very interesting creator bob michael walsh is a artist um, we're seeing this a lot lately i'm noticing like a lot of people that are flipping you know they're yeah. they're colorists like you know last week with standstill a colorist writing yep. that amazing book um yep. uh, we've got michael walsh who's an artist and now he's begun writing and from what i my take on it is i i believe michael walsh didn't start writing until uh the silver coin i think that that is his first work as a writer mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I could be wrong, you know, that would require like a little bit more research than I can do like right now, uh, you know, going through all of his credits and seeing what he's credited with. But from what I can recall, the silver coin is his first uh, writing endeavor. Bob, are you a fan of silver coin? Did you read silver coin? Um, I did not. You've not read any silver coin, man. Silver coin is, is really good. Uh, Chip Zdarsky, um, Ed Brisson, Kelly Thompson, Jeff Lemire. You know, it's like an anthology book uh, that that Michael Walsh is is uh, sorry, he's illustrating and he is writing on on some uh, Michael Walsh, a, a very interesting creator, and he's really really good with horror. Uh, might I add? Um, but he's done work on Secret Avengers, on Archer and Armstrong, mm -hmm. and the X Files season ten specifically, on uh, Star Wars: The Last Jedi. Bob, if you're familiar with that book, if you've ever heard of um, Space Wars: The Last, uh, The Last Spaceman, um, he he did some work on that, uh, some artwork on that as well. Uh, X Men. The worst X Man ever. Have you read that book, Bob? That was <laughs> that was written by Max Bemis. Have you ever read that book? It's a really good book. Really interesting. No, but I need to. Yeah, that's that's a really good book. I think it's like a five issue mini. It's really cool. Um, Jughead, The Hunger, We Can Never Go Home, Star Wars Proper, Doctor Strange, The Punisher, Magic Bullets, Six Million Dollar Man, Carnage, The Black Hood, Bucky Barnes, The Winter Soldier, The Vision. 
The Brother James, Creep Show, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Spider Gwen, Harbinger. I don't know, Bob. The list goes on and on. Um, you don't want to hear me talk more. You want to hear me talk more about this book, and that's what I'm going to do. Let's get into the book, Bob. How about the story beats? How did you feel Michael Walsh brought this story uh, to the page here? How did you feel about the beats? I I love the beats. I mean, it was just such a smooth read. It was so straightforward. And that is not... I I don't know how how to verbalize what I'm saying, but... I, I enjoy different aspects of writing. I, I really like reading, you know, when people like have a, a tale that's unfolding in certain ways and we're getting uh, glimpses of this and this and, and, you know, it's a slow burn and everything. But I really appreciate just some good, straightforward yep. storytelling. Mm-hmm. And that is what this is. You know, I don't have to guess anything. It's all right there on Front Street and it's written so well. And Michael Walsh does one of the things that is my favorite thing in the entire world. And every time a writer does it, I I talk about it. He is just really trusting, you know, that the story is going to tell the art here. Um, Of course, you know, it might be a little different because Michael Walsh is writing and illustrating this book. So he trusts himself. But I mean, hell, like it, it just, it's so good. Uh, it, yeah, this is, the story beats are very, very good here. This is, a, this is told wonderfully. I, yeah, I, there's, I, I honestly can't, com- I can't find anything to complain about with the story beats at all. Not one thing. It's very good. How about the dialogue, Bob? This one I think is a very easy read. Um, I mean, I doubt I spent more than 10 minutes reading this book. I, I was going to say, I mean, speaking of dialogue, it's not, dialogue heavy at all i mean there and there's enough to where you understand what's going on Mm -hmm. which is it's very weird too because i think that i half expected this whole line of universal monsters books to share like similarities um in some kind of way and with dracula we got this very uh poetic like weird interpretation of of dracula uh, very nuanced and very just you know, moody and atmospheric and very strange with creature of the black lagoon. I'm not going to lie, Bob. I really wanted to like that book. And there was so much dialogue in it. I was like, this is a novel. This isn't a comic book. Mm -hmm. I felt bad because I I could see a lot of work went into it, but it just, it wasn't for me. And you know how I feel about something that's just too dialogue heavy. It's like, come on, this is a comic book. It's not a novel. Like you, you gotta be able to separate the two. I I think you and a big part of the comic population out there. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is perfect to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, I know Michael is trusting himself here to tell the story, but that's fine because he does it so elegantly and, and really well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he's really letting the story breathe and come to life. (laughs) Again, I'm I'm using topical, uh, Frankenstein references here, but yeah, I wow, um, really, really good on the dialogue. It just it fits so perfectly. I think seeing uh, a big portion of the story through the eyes of like the young child who's grieving the loss of his his father at like you know his untimely death, his early death at a young age and everything. Like, what is he supposed to say? You know, I mean, he's like he's he's he he's got this you know almost delusion where he's like come back, you know, come back. Like you, you hear that kind of repeated a, a few times here and there. And I mean, somebody who's lost a parent or, or whatever, like no matter how old you are, you kind of feel that way, you know, yeah. especially through the eyes of like a young child. It's like, no, this wasn't supposed to happen. You know, not like this, not now come back, you know? And, and wow. It's just, you know, what is he supposed to say? It, it's wonderful. It's, yeah, it's really and, good. Yeah. And like you said, at the, the, the very beginning that, uh, that dialogue he's talking about when he's talking about the uh, toy that his father made mm-hmm, him, mm-hmm. even though his father was working all the time, he still had time to make that. Yep. And the, the other children at the home that he was uh, sent to after his father passed away, mm-hmm. you know, I guess they broke said toy and he's saying, you know, you're the only one who knows, who knew how to put it together uh-huh. and you know, why did you have to leave me? I'm sure there's a lot, I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, especially 
children of that age who lose a parent's parent. I'm sure there's a lot of them like, you know, why did you leave me? Yep. And, you know, only you could do this and mm-hmm. you got to do this. So, I mean, the dialogue was perfect. Yeah, it, it really was. This is, wow. Um, the narrative of this book, again, A++, plus plus, man. Like, it doesn't get much better than this, in my opinion. Like, it's just, it's so straightforward. And, and to take the approach that Michael Walsh took with this book, which is, you know, it's illustrated in the synopsis there. And we've talked about it before. And we talked about it last week and everything. He's looking at this as, as a story told from each body part. You know, not each body part, like, you know, but, you know, four different yeah. body parts or whatever, yeah. four important parts of, of this story. And this one being the hands and, and through this young child's eyes and everything. God, like the narrative of this is just so good because it's this kid and he's he's he doesn't want to leave the monster behind because there's a part of his father there and and he wants to take some kind of revenge or whatever. I, this is just the narrative is perfect. See, and, and you pointed this out earlier, mm-hmm. and this is something narratively that uh, my, that uh, Michael did, that I'm glad he did. Um, we all know the story of Frankenstein. Yep. Though. I mm-hmm. mean, Frankenstein has, of course, you know, originally written by Mary Shelley. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not exactly, sh- I can't remember exactly when she wrote it, but I do know that Everybody, everybody and their mother knows, you know, Frankenstein is, Mm -hmm. you know, an old work. You know, everybody knows. uh, 1818. 1818. Everybody knows the story of the uh, scientist and his right-hand man, Mm -hmm. um, you know, dig up different bodies. You know, he takes different body parts, stitches them together. Mm -hmm. So everybody knows that. I'm glad that we didn't have to go through the whole, like you said, the whole part of the hands being stitched together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, just just because I think that would have slowed it down. And again, everybody knows the story by now. Yeah, so we don't need it. There's no, no, there's no need I mean, for that. everybody knows that that's what happens. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, everybody knows it's implied that it happens. It's very interesting, too, that Michael was able to take something like Frankenstein, a very, very interesting character, and obviously, you know, the, the focal point in the story and everything, and and make us more intrigued by what's going on with the little boy with a Frankenstein, with the monster of Frankenstein in the background, and the creation of Frankenstein, and all of this exciting stuff going on. Yeah, that's... Uh... To me, to me, that was, I mean, I was reading it, and I mean, that was just, that was just a powerful image mm-hmm. where he thinks Frankenstein is going to attack him, and then he's holding his father's hand. Yep. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, even though it's, it, of course, it's not his, you know, father, it's not his father's body, mm-hmm. but I mean, he's still holding the last remaining part of his father in yep. his hand. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's. So odd to say, but I mean, yeah, this is really powerful stuff. This is really good. I mean, I just, it, uh, to take something like a comic book and, you know, as a medium, to take something like the story of the monster of Frankenstein, you know, a, a classic horror and, and all of that stuff, and, and make it so personal, you know, about this little boy who's grieving his father and, and trying to, to come to terms with that in some kind of way or whatever. And, and this is going on and everything. Just, wow, uh, really powerful stuff. I, I, yeah, I can't imagine how Michael Walsh came up with this idea and then executed this in, in, in story. But, wow, it's really good. Uh, the world building, fantastic. You know, the world building is really, really good. And, you know, we don't, we don't move through this world a lot. You know, we're in a graveyard. We're in the kind of the lab. Uh, that's, that's really it. That's pretty much where the story is. And, uh, man, yeah, I, I felt like, you know, this, this fits in perfectly. If you've ever seen or read Frankenstein, you know, any of that stuff, if you're familiar with Frankenstein, I mean, it's like, you can just imagine putting this in the background, you know, like Mm -hmm. this is just something that got overlooked in the story, like, you know, and it was happening all along. Like I, I would, I would believe that, you know, it fits so perfectly into the story of Frankenstein, uh, Man, yeah, I, I love the world building here. Bob, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I mean, he, he captured the world of 
mm -hmm. perfectly. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to say this, you know, and I'm going to go out on a limb here. At least I'll, I'll speak for myself. I won't speak for you. But at least story-wise, you know, I, I honestly can't find a single thing that I didn't like here. This is this is top tier uh, comic book writing, you know, at its finest. This is really, really good. And that's really exciting to hear because, I mean, again, just think of, of the material that we're talking about here. We're talking about Frankenstein. We're talking about something that everybody knows, you know, something that everybody's experienced in some way or another. Some Most people have like... You know, I talked about uh, dressing up like Frankenstein, you know, many times at Halloween as a kid yeah. and stuff. And, uh, you know, this is this is something that everybody knows. And it's it's like a, you know, or origin or something, you know, of Spider-Man or Batman coming out right now and, and being like, wow, this is this is perfect. You know, it's just it, that's really hard to do. It's just been done so many times. How do you get a different perspective, get a different you know take on this? And yeah. and Michael Walsh really not the storytelling out of the park here really let's see if he can do the same thing with the art bob i want you to lead with the character art here because i i just do <laughs> well i mean a character art and overall art mm -hmm. i mean i love for this tone of the book i and what it was i love the art stuff i mean he gave the characters you know that you know kind of um you know, older, like 1800s kind of, mm -hmm. you know, look. And I mean, just, yeah, I mean, overall, I mean, just, uh, he, he gave it that, you know, darker, he gave everything that darker atmospheric tone. And uh, yeah, I know I'm lumping all the art here together, but, you know, I in a, in a book like this, you have to. Yeah, it's, oh, okay, I'm going to say this. Yeah, the character art. I loved it. I'm already a huge fan of Michael Walsh's art on the silver coin, on on Michael Walsh's art on you know pretty much everything that I can think of. He's got this certain quality to him. Of course, he's playing a lot in in, in shadows and everything. Mm -hmm. Really fits the tone of the story, of course. But yeah. I love the way there's there's two people that are. I mean, you know, there's probably a few people who are similar in this regard. But like, I see a lot of Robert Hack in this art, which I love. Um, and I'm not saying that Michael Walsh is biting Robert Hack's style in any way. It's just they have a similar kind of style. But I really love the old feel, like you were saying, that kind of classic feel yeah. that it has to it. And I really love – this is something that's going to be a little harder for me to to illustrate here, but – pun intended. But, you know, there's like this unfinished quality to certain things. Um, and I love that because I feel that it's very intentional – like, you know, it's like, let me focus on this. And this is more of a secondary thing. And it's kind of unfinished in the background. And it fits the tone so well. I, I just love it. I, I think it works so well. Um, of course, you know, every single episode, every time we cover a comic book, we have a very, very important thing that we have to cover. A very important uh, test, if you will, that, mm -hmm. that, that the book must pass. Uh, the artist is usually responsible for this task. And this mm -hmm. is passing bob's background test and you know if this is your first episode or 85th episode uh i'll go ahead and say you know bob's background test is is something that you know it, it's very strict criteria you know you can't no one you can't just be anybody and pass bob's background test you know, there has to be purpose there has to be uh, a reason for the backgrounds to be the way that they are there mm -hmm. has to be uh, detail put in to a certain level. Bob wants to see, you know, tile on flooring or cracks in the asphalt or whatever, um, if it's important to tell that story. So while it's not like a one size fits all uh, background test, mm -hmm. it's definitely something that's very, very important to Bob and very important to me and very important to you as our listeners. Uh, so Bob, of course, you know, I'm going to ask the uh, age old question. Does Michael Walsh pass your background test in this issue? See, and I, sh I should, uh, you know, I've said this before. The backgrounds have to match the book. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, oh boy, do these backgrounds definitely <laughs> match this book. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'm, uh, it's, it's, and it doesn't need to be because of the book it is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these backgrounds, of course, aren't, you know, like, 
you know, you can't see, you don't see like each individual like strand of hair mm-hmm. or each individual, you know, brick or anything. But in a horror in a, a horror book, mm-hmm. you don't need to. Yeah. And I mean, he he does the art perfect in this book. Yeah, and one thing that I want to point out, you had it open to a, a couple of pages with some panels uh, that that I think really stuck to me um, was. You know, we have a, a few panels in this book that are just, you know, the background is solid white. There's nothing in the background yeah. whatsoever. And I think that they're very purposeful and they really illustrate what's going on. Like the hand-holding scenes, you know, um, the little boy reaching out for his father's hand and everything. I don't want to see the bricks on the wall behind that. I want to see that hand and that is yeah. it. Like, I want to see those two hands, you know, touching or, or pulling away or whatever. Same thing with the the shadowy scenes that we get of the boy grabbing the knife. I don't want to see anything else because in that boy's mind, in those scenes, the only thing that matters is that little piece of his father that he's still got or that little bit of I'm going to do something about this that the boy has. You know, it, it's the focus there. And, you know, maybe a lesser artist would uh, do something more with the backgrounds in those scenes. And, and I it doesn't need it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of my one of my favorite panels in this book is just it's a white background. And all you see is the shadow of the boy holding Frankenstein's hand, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. holding his father's hand. Yeah, that's such a good and panel. And I'm so glad that he didn't put in any background detail to mm-hmm. take away from that image. Yeah, I'm with you. It's just, uh, yeah, it's it's almost just a white background with silhouettes, you know, and mm-hmm. that's it. Uh, yeah, really, really nicely done. Uh, I don't know, Bob. We're we're batting pretty high right now. We've yep. got you know two more things to cover. Uh, let's see if we can take it down a notch. I don't know. How about the locations? I talked about where they are. You know, we, we've got a graveyard. We've got you know the lab, uh, maybe like an office or something. That's really about it. The inside of a carriage for a second. Yeah, and I mean they're they're just they're just done so creepy. Yeah, uh, it it fits so perfect. Like how I don't know. It's 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 such a vibe, you know, to to borrow from the kids. You know, it's such a vibe. The whole book is a vibe. Like I'm I'm loving, and of course we'll get into the color and everything in a minute. But uh, you know that that hue and everything we're getting over the graveyard and just. Uh, what's happening inside of the dissection lab and everything and i mean yeah man the you couldn't do much better than this i really don't see how you could improve this at all okay lastly um we have colors uh colors by tony marie griffin dedicated colorist on this book and i'm just gonna lead with i i love the color yeah the 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 color is so moody we get the use of green in this book is is really cool because obviously that's iconic with Frankenstein. Well, not a, not only the use of green, mm-hmm. but um, in the um, in the beginning in the uh, cemetery scene, mm-hmm. you know, you get those um, you get you know you get the washed out reds. Yep. And you get the um, muted darker tones. Yeah, the 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 colorist did a really good job. Um, you know, just enhancing the atmosphere. Yeah, really good. I'm I'm really really impressed with the with the colors here and and how everything worked together. Again, man, it's such a vibe. It's so it's so good. Okay, well, uh, look, we've we've talked about the book. You know, we we've talked about what we liked. Uh, we didn't really find too many things we didn't like. I don't know what we will. You know, maybe in our wrap up here or whatever. But uh, Bob, is this enough for you to recommend this to our listeners? Is this enough for you to add it to your pull list and pick up issue number two? Uh, thoughts? Oh, I, I would I would definitely recommend this to everybody. Mm-hmm. And to me, this is, you know, leaps and bounds better than Dracula. Yes. Uh, and, and I'm with you there. This is such a good book. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, we have this problem every now and again where I'm like, you know, we go over a book and it's so good. And then I'm like, shit how's anything gonna top this you know like how, how is this not gonna be like our book of the year you know at the end of the year or whatever um this is just superb it's done so well there's not a complaint i can i i, I mean i read it i don't know four times and i just enjoyed it every single time this is just really adds to the story of the monster of frankenstein and dr frankenstein and elevates it and i i 
you can't ask for anything else in a classic story. You know, a lot of times people, you know, say you mess with like material from their childhood or whatever, and it ruined their childhood or whatever. Like this only adds and elevates, which is, I mean, that's, that's huge. Uh, that's something that's not easily done. And yeah, like you said, Dracula, it wasn't really my vibe. Like it just didn't, I, I it, it wasn't great. It had like an atmosphere to it and it, it was interesting and it was an interesting take and it was like a swing for me personally. It was a miss. I don't know if everyone agrees with that or not. Some people probably really liked it. Uh, same thing with um, the uh, creature of the black lagoon. It, it just didn't hit for me. Like it wasn't great mm -hmm. uh, for me. This is the first home run in the universal monsters stuff uh, from, from image and skybound and Anybody who has to contend with this, um, you're really, really going to have to pull out all the stops to, to top this. This is, I, I just don't see how you could do better than this. This is, this takes the impossible task of taking something we're all very, very familiar with. A lot of people really, really love and, and everybody knows and elevating that. And I just don't see very many people doing that. So huge huge kudos to michael walsh and uh tony marie griffin like you guys have done the impossible here and i cannot wait to read more of this series this is a huge recommend add to your pool list shit add every cover you know <laughs> whatever call your local comic book shop right now and make sure you get issue number two uh through four or whenever the end is is all i can say mm -hmm. With that being said, we will take a quick break and we'll return in just a moment. Did you know there was a Doctor Strange movie in 1978? Or that Tim Burton and Nicolas Cage almost made a Superman movie in the mid-90s? On Superhero Cinephiles, we take you on a journey into the world of superhero films including the acclaimed, the infamous, and the obscure. And you might just be surprised at some of our takes, because here we want to talk about the things we love, not the things we hate. Listen to Superhero Cinephiles on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Visit us on the web at SuperheroCinephiles.com or find us on Twitter and Instagram at SuperCinemaPod. Hey, and welcome back to the all-new Audrey for No More Comics podcast issue number 85 bob it's always such a struggle to accidentally say uh or, or to to say issue instead of episode you know i i, I think I earlier you said both uh, yeah i'm sure i did <laughs> either way we are back to talk to you guys about some comic books that are coming out in local comic book shops next week of course before we do so you know we always have a little uh, special service announcement that we have to make or rather bob has to make um, it's very important that you guys know, you know, sometimes uh, the comic book shops don't come to stores. And for that reason, it's disclaimer time. Welcome to disclaimer time. Grab your inner John shirts for disclaimer time with Bob. Like I say this in every other week. I love the opening, by the way. <laughs> like I say this in every other week, you know, these are just some of the books that may or may not mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. of that. You know, reason distribution schedule mm -hmm. be coming out next week. So if you want a more in-depth list, you know, please consult elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You can always call your local comic shop. You know, please and thank you. Go a long way. They definitely do manners. You know, they work kids. Yeah, so I mean, they may give you a list of you know who's writing it, who's coloring it, mm -hmm. who's drawing it, uh, brief synopsis. Yep. Mm -hmm. If the synopsis is brief, I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> go longer than others. Yeah. I mean, there's a multitude of different avenues you can go through. But again, please and thank you go a long way. They certainly do. They certainly do. Yeah. Uh, so starting off the list from the House of Ideas, we have Ultimates number four. Bob, I love the solicit here because I do this too. is, this I do is too. great. Writer Dennis, Dennis, Dennis Camp, that's what I'm going to go with, is quoted saying, if you want to understand Robert Downey Jr. as Doom, you must read Ultimates number four. So if you want to understand what's going on with the MCU moving forward, you have to read this issue. Bob, what are the chances that this issue does not sell out? Uh, very slim <laughs> with that with that 
kind of vague solicit. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm not sure what to think about that. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna go ahead and say, you know, a lot of things are gimmicky in comics, and a lot of times, you know, speaking of cash grabs, you know, they're just trying to make sure you buy the book and everything. I'm definitely gonna be picking up a copy of this book. <laughs> Going over to Detective Comics Comics, the yes. <laughs> very the redundant publisher. So nice, we named it twice. We have Trinity Special World's Finest Number One. Bob, this is a collection of backup stories featuring Trinity, the daughter of Wonder Woman. A collection of backup stories. Mm-hmm. Very mm-hmm. interesting. And she's got cool glasses on the cover. You know, they're stars, so. That is true. Doesn't get much cooler than that. Sticking, sticking with the redundant. Uh, comic publisher we have <laughs> batman number 152 now this is just a tie into absolute power of course so amanda waller's all over it but i will say there's no chance in hell we haven't seen this cover before bob uh at least the no, image of the bat oh, and the cat we, kissing yeah. on the cover like i i oh we've seen it yeah we've, <laughs> seen, we've seen it many times i mean before. i i feel like that's just the wedding special you know there was definitely yeah. a variant cover with that on it there's no way there wasn't yeah Staying with DC, we have Absolute Power number three. Speaking of Absolute Power. Bob, part three of the Absolute Power crossover. The cover art is inspired by the Incredible Hulk 340. That's right. That cover swipe that everyone loves to do with uh, Hulk and Wolverine, with uh, Hulk reflected in Wolverine's claws. I mean, it's definitely not a bad cover swipe at all. No, this one's good. I like it. Uh, It's cool. Yeah. Uh, going back to the House of Ideas, we have Star Wars The Acolyte Kelnaka number one. I'm so happy that the name was in the title, so you had to say it because, <laughs> wow, I have to say that it's Kelnaka's first appearance, and I would not have been able to pronounce the name, so thank you so much for that. Uh, but yeah, speaking well. of The Acolyte, you know, um, you never know. I mean, the series could get revived. Uh, the petition could work, and maybe this will be a very important character moving forward. I, I'd grab a copy of this. Yeah, I mean, it very well could be. Staying with the House of Ideas, we have Daredevil number thirteen. Bob, a dangerous and lethal new enemy wearing a familiar face has made itself known, and violent force in the lives of the Daredevils. That is confusing. There's two characters called Daredevil. Mm-hmm. There sure is. The woman without fear, the man without fear. They both have no fear. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like a, a cool uh, ad for that 90s uh, t-shirt company, No Fear. <laughs> <laughs> Daredevil, No Fear crossover. All right. Uh, we have the spectacular Spider-Man number seven. Man, this one has the first appearance of... Knave. Knave. (laughs) Knave. Described as a truly terrifying new addition to the Spider Rogues Gallery. Yeah. Uh, Staying with Marvel, we have Spider Boy number 11. This one's cool. It's a new arc begins here with a new cast member, or sorry, new cast members and an all new supervillain. I love the cover because it's got. Uh, Spider Boy grabbing on to the outside of a school bus on that emergency door handle, uh, you know, holding his little Spider Man lunchbox. Super, super fun. This you is know, just a fun series. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't this supposed to be not a limited, but a, uh, but a, a mini? I thought so. I think it's just doing that well. You know, it's. I I was I was gonna say because I mean miniseries usually doesn't go to number eleven, does mm-hmm, it? Mm-hmm. And good for them, you know, because I remember mm-hmm. so many people, you know, hating on this when it first happened. You know, the introduction of Spider Boy. Do we really have to have this? this, is, and this? this yeah, would we do. Such a cool series. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, you know, I hope you guys have your foot in your mouth right now. Is all I can say. Yeah, we have Moon Knight, the Infinity Watch annual number one. Yes, Moon Knight's getting a. Um, Infinity Watch tie-in. Yep, part seven to the Infinity Watch. Check it out. Is he fighting Power Girl on the cover? <laughs> I certainly hope not. That would be a really weird crossover that just you know hasn't uh, existed before. We have a tie-in to Venomore. We have Venomore Spider-Man number two. Yeah, uh, a really cool cover. Lots of crazy stuff going on here. Lots of goblins. Lots of stuff. Hmm. We have 
front, staying with Marvel, we have Venom War number two. Mm -hmm. uh, staying with Marvel, we have Marvel Zombies Dawn of Decay number one. Yeah, a four issue limited series with Groot and Hulk, the only heroes impervious to becoming zombies. Bob, that's a pretty cool concept, you know? They can't become zombies. You've got uh, Iron Man, you've got Scarlet Witch, you've got Captain America there on the cover, all zombified, and they're, uh, you know, grabbing at Groot and everything, but he can't become a zombie, so what are they What are they going to do to him? I was going to say he's made of wood. Yeah, zombie wood? I mean, I guess it works. Wood zombies? I don't know. I mean, could you zombify if your blood is chlorophyll? <laughs> More like borophyll. All right. <laughs> um, we have What If Donald Duck Becomes Thor? I don't know, Bob. What if Donald Duck became Thor? I have to say I'm pretty done with this gimmick. <laughs> it's not I, – I, I don't know. I mean, I hopefully they're making money, but geez, it's just who cares. A parody retelling of Thor's first appearance in origin with Donald Duck as the hero. We have a new adjective-led X-Men <laughs> book. We have exceptional X-Men number one. Thank God for adjectives. The first appearance of Bronze, previewed in an excerpt of this issue, X-Men, from the Ashes Sampler. The series will introduce three all-new mutants, the metallic and whip-welding Bronze, the emotion-stirring Exo. Thank you. And the stealth-skilled fighter, Melee? Melee. Melee. That's what I said. I said. From Archie <laughs> Comics, we have Sabrina the Teenage Witch Annual Spectacular 2024, number 2024. <laughs> now tell me why we've had no ongoing Sabrina, but we've got an annual. I don't know what's happening. That's a good question. And, uh, tell, me, and tell me what's up with the number. Yeah, I don't know. Unless this is like the little digest, which I guess it could be. This could be like the little digest you see at the grocery store that you don't typically see at a comic book store. So it could be those smaller digest books. But this one has the first appearance of Mother Striga, Striga the first witch. Um, probably a good one to pick up, Bob. I know I will. I love my Sabrina. I love my Archie comics. For you David Cronenberg fans out there. From DC Comics, we have Plastic Man No More number one. Oh no, a four issue limited series telling a darker noir story with elements of body horror. Yes, so it should be very interesting. Yeah. From Dark Horse, we have Star Wars The High Republic Adventures Crash and Burn. Crash and Burn, and I guess this happens a century before the Acolyte, so that's good. And finally, from Dark Horse, we have Star Wars High Republic Adventures Echoes of Fear. The first appearance of Darth Ravi. Bob, do you know anything about Darth Ravi? I do not. Brand new character. Guess this is his first appearance. Yes. So that's all we've got. Bob, we've got three comics on the lovely wheel here. Not sponsored by, but listed on the What are the you doing, Will Names? I don't know. You know, I kind of feel like maybe this is what happened. You know, 15, 20 years ago, Wheel of Names registered the name. They paid in advance for the domain and just, you know, it keeps coming off of their credit card every year. But the uh, the founders of the website have moved on and live in a cave somewhere. So that's all I can think because, you know, there's no way they're not listening. Bob, time to spin the wheel. See where it lands. It could either be an X-Men week. It could be a Raphael Albuquerque week. Or it could be a broken internet week. But it looks like we will be hanging with Scott Snyder and Raphael Albuquerque for Duck and Cover number one next week. Very cool. Very excited. Again, we talked off air. Uh, Raphael Albuquerque talked to us about this book way back when we talked to him, whenever the hell that was. So really excited to have that uh, on the show. I'm excited to check that one out and talk about it. I think that about wraps us up, though, Bob. Uh, unless you have anything else you want to say, we are the All New All Different number one comics podcast. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. It sure as hell does. Uh, and, you know, for your responsibility this week, I don't know, use our hashtag all new, all different nation. Uh, you can try to win a free copy of this Universal Monsters Frankenstein, but I really don't want to give it up. So uh, you're going to have to try really hard if you want a copy of this one. Is all I can say. Post this paid by Bob. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>